good evening. It's so wonderful to see such a large turnout for this event. We're very proud this evening. First, let me represent, um, introduce myself. My name is Tony Villa. I am the current president of the Cove Lake Estates Homeowners Association. I have been a resident of DeKalb County since 1985 when I moved here. And I have lived in this neighborhood for the past 20 years. I haven't been in the gym since my last child graduated from here in 2009. In the cafeteria, it still smells the same. <laughs> very happy to be here. Um, very happy to see you all. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment to thank Ms. Benford, who is the principal now at Cedar Grove High School. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here. As I said, old home for me. And the school is very much a part of our community, so we're always very happy uh, to include and be included in everything that they have. Uh, I would also like to recognize our various county officials uh, from I see our police, fire, code enforcement. If you would stand, please, so that we can recognize you. Forgive me if I don't know your name. And also, most, almost importantly, is I see a, a great number of our homeowners association presidents. I see a great number of my neighbors that I've seen throughout the year. And it is wonderful to see you. So I would like to applaud those of you who turned out this evening for this event. I'd like to give you a hand and applaud yourselves for being here. We are here, I hope everyone had a happy new year. Forgive me, I am not a public speaker. It is not my forte. Um, but we are here this year in 2012. This is the first town hall meeting of the year hosted um, by our CEO, Burrell Ellis. We are happy that he chose this particular area. As I said, I have lived here for quite some years. I live here on purpose. I have moved throughout this particular area that we're speaking of, and I am encouraged and very hopeful for some of the changes that I see on the horizon. I hope that you're encouraged, and I hope that you're hopeful, and I hope that you're informed as well as some of the things that we see happening um, in our neighborhood. Most of you have lived here at least as long, if not longer, than I have. Most of you have been way more active than I have. I appreciate you, and I just want to be like you. So I'm very pleased to welcome to our neighborhood. I hope this is the first of many, many meetings and many opportunities that we'll have to share our vision and that our CEO will have to share his vision so that we can truly be one to cab. And at this time, I would bring to you our CEO, W. Burrell Ellis. Thank you, Ms. Villa, for that very warm introduction. Thank you all. And um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm honored to be here and uh, honored to uh, be back here. And um, thank you for being here and for being on time. Uh, I've got a little competition tonight uh, with the President of the United States. He goes on at nine. Everybody already knows that. I see you nodding your heads. I always like to start on time and I like to end on time. I especially want to end on time so that you can get home and watch that little address he's going to give tonight. <laughs> Stay with you. Uh, it's important for us to hear what uh, our President has to say. Let, let me. Um, let, let me uh, uh, thank again Cedar Grove High School and their principal, Ms. Benford. Benford, did I get it right? Okay, Ms. Benford, thank you. Thank you so much. And the DeKalb County School System for the partnership that we have. I was on the phone today with um, the uh, superintendent um, and uh, Dr. Atkinson, and we were talking about the things that we could do together and the things that we're doing together to work to uh, build that one DeKalb that we've been talking about. Uh, let, let me. Uh, begin by saying that when I ran, and it's been three plus years ago now, believe it or not, 
for the office of CEO, I promised you that I was going to work really hard to make your priorities the priorities of the county. And you and I listened, and we held a series of in-home get-togethers and town hall meetings, and we've continued that. And you told me what your priorities were. You said you wanted a safe to cab. And so we've got our public safety officials, but I'm pleased to report tonight that crime is down in the cab county. You said you wanted a county that was fiscally accountable. And it's been a rough three plus years because of this national and global economic recession that we've been living through. I see we have our chief appraiser. I'm glad to see you here, Mr. Hicks, because when they ask me the real tough questions, I'm gonna bring you up here. But everybody knows that the markets have been volatile all of the markets, but including the real estate markets. And property values have fallen as a result of that, and that's our primary source of tax revenue. And DeKalb County lost over the last three years about 21% of the value of real estate property in this county due to no fault of our own. That's just a reality. It's a national reality. But we were able to step up. The citizens said we want services. We've been able to continue the core essential services that our citizens care about. The quality of life continues to be high in DeKalb County. And if you think it's not, invite some of your friends from north. Tell them to come on down to Georgia and tell them to come to DeKalb County. In the last year, we've been able to construct uh, seven new rec centers. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, seven new libraries with one more on the way this year. Uh, we've uh, improved eight of our parks, including two new rec centers. Uh, we've made some substantial improvements. You have a stakeholders report, which outlines a lot of this progress that I'm talking about today. Uh, we have streetscape improvements along Memorial Drive and Candler Road and Buford Highway. And so, um, I mean, we, we've done a lot to continue to invest in this county. Uh, but our work is not finished. Uh, in the coming year, we're going to begin construction of two new senior centers. And that's good progress. Of course, we, we've got some good, yeah, that, that's important. Two new senior centers right here in DeKalb County. Right now, through a public-private partnership, we're building a YMCA in Stone Mountain, a new YMCA being built by the county with funds that you as citizens voted on in the, in the bond referendum. And because of that, we're putting that money to good use, creating jobs, building new facilities. We'll open that in uh, next summer, this coming summer, and then we'll have a new facility in an underserved area of DeKalb County. Uh, so we've got some good things going on, but still our work is not finished. Uh, this past fall, we opened a renewable energy facility. We didn't open it, I'm sorry, we broke ground on a renewable energy facility where we're gonna be taking landfill gas, we're gonna convert that gas into automobile fuel. And initially, we're going to use it to fuel 306 sanitation vehicles that the county owns. But eventually, we're going to sell that. So we're actually taking trash and converting that to gas and then converting that gas to cash. And that's good news. And that is that, yeah, you should applaud. Th thank you for applauding that. Let me tell you why. That's a model facility in the southeast of the United States. It'll be one of the few in the country. And we're working. It's a public-private partnership. It's a result of a grant we've gotten from the federal government. And then we're going to be uh, launching that this spring in a major announcement. Uh, the private sector folks are even trying to get the president down because it fits in line with the goals of the president. We'll see uh, whether we can get him or not. Uh, but it, it's a big thing. We have a program called One to Cab Lives. And One to Cab Lives is our umbrella for a number of housing programs. But one of the exciting programs that comes under that umbrella is our Good Neighbor Next Door program, which we launched this fall. And through that Good Neighbor Next Door program, we're taking houses that were vacated because of the foreclosure crisis in our neighborhoods, quality housing, nice housing, and we're getting that housing put back on the market. And for those who are eligible, our firefighters, our police officers, and our teachers, they're then able to work with the private sector, our private sector partner, Citizens Trust Bank, and get that housing at a discounted 50% value. So we're restoring our neighborhoods, <laughs> taking previously vacated property, selling it at the market rate, but then getting the discount so we can get our community heroes, our first responders, our firefighters, and our police officers, 
and our teachers, the people who model and shape our future for our children in that housing and in our neighborhoods. And so that's good news. Those are the people we want to have living around us. And then one of the more exciting programs is our One to Care Works. This is our jobs creation. This is our stimulus program for the county. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be upgrading our water and sewer system here in DeKalb County. We have an aging water and sewer system. Some of our pipes are over 25 years old. Some as old as 50 years old. Don't raise your hands. Anybody in here over 50 years old? No, I said don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand. I'm over 50 years old, OK? If I told you that some of the stuff I had to have checked on and, and all the pokes and the prods I've had to have over the last couple years, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're over 50, things begin to break down. And it's no different with water and sewer infrastructure. We don't see it, but if it doesn't work, we know it. The toilets have got to flush. When we cut on the faucet, we want to see clear water, right? Not brown water. And we can't wait until the faults start to happen before we start to, and then to repair the infrastructure. We've got to repair it now because that's one of the things that ensures that we're going to maintain a high quality of life in DeKalb County. And so we've initiated a program over the next eight and a half years to upgrade that system. And we're going to be digging up the pipes. I understand that some of you are going to need some hookups to, your, to the sewer system because you may be on septic tank. And there's going to be op opportunities to do that because we're going to be digging up and repairing the pipes and repairing our, our sewage plants. But as a result of that, we're going to be creating work. There's going to be work to be done. And what we're going to be doing through our job stimulus program, One to Care Works, is to ensure that those jobs, first and foremost, because a lot of them will be contracted out to the private sector, go to local small base businesses. And we're going to train the Cab County citizens. They're already being trained to do the work. And we've got some private sector partners that we're working with so that when these people that we contract with have to go out and hire people, I've got my director of workforce development, Cheryl Chapman here. She's going to have, she already has a list. How many people you have on the list, Cheryl? All right, you awake, you with me? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. I know she is. But we're going to be creating, uh, I, I believe the number is over 4,000 jobs. Over 4,000 jobs of, of between now and the end of 2013. 4,700. 4,700. Thank you, Dr. Samama. He was writing a speech for me. Thank you for being here. Um, so over 4,700 jobs by the end of 2013. That's a lot of jobs, okay? For the Cab County, for the Cab County residents, the Cab County citizens will be targeted. And one of the biggest concerns I heard when I first became CEO from our small and minority businesses that we, that we do business with is that they would get selected to do work. They would, they would be a part, we have a local small business enterprise program and, and, and I was the one who authored that legislation when I was a county commissioner. And that's designed to make sure that local small businesses and primarily minority and women-owned businesses get the work in DeKalb County or get partnered with larger contractors so that they can learn how to do the work and have the opportunities to grow their businesses. Local small business enterprises, the ones that pay the taxes, hire people in DeKalb County, can then be put back to work. But a lot of them said to me that, well, we're getting selected. The vendors, the prime contractors are getting selected based upon representations that you're partnering, that they're partnering with us, but then we're not getting the work. So in the One DeKalb Works program, we thought it was important that we have a monitor, somebody who could audit and make sure that the work was actually going to the people in DeKalb County, that the pool would be available, and to local small business enterprises. And we thought it was important that it be a trusted partner, somebody you know, somebody you trusted. So we've partnered with the National Urban League and the, and the Urban League of Greater Atlanta. And the National Urban League is going to be doing the monitoring of the work to ensure, in fact, their president, Mark Morial, came down here and signed a memorandum of understanding. So that's more good news that we have. 
And so we're going to be creating jobs, restoring our neighborhoods, uh, uh, creating opportunities. We're rebuilding our infrastructure, building our libraries, renewing our parks, uh, streetscape improvements. Many things that you don't see happening in other communities are happening right here in DeKalb County with new facilities scheduled to open in 2012. And so that's our vision for moving forward. That's the work that we still have before us. And, and all in a united spirit, what we're calling One DeKalb. A lot of these programs are labeled One DeKalb because we think it's important that we work together, that we work in a spirit of unity. Because when we work together, in partnerships, public and private, and with community-based organizations, and with the faith-based community, we can leverage our dollars and get a lot done. Because it costs money to do the work that we're called to do. And so that's an overview. I want to spend the bulk of tonight to answer the questions. I'll do my best to answer any question that you raise. Uh, I have some staff here. If I can't ans answer the question directly, I'll punt to them. I'll be honest with you if I don't know the answer, and, and none of them know the answer, then I'll just tell you, we got to get back to you. If you ask me that narrow question, when that pothole in front of my house is going to be filled, okay, I'm probably going to have to direct you to someone, and then we'll take your name down. But if you ask me a broader question, like when are you all going to begin doing, you know, something, you know, you, you get the, my point, then we'll do our best to answer that for the entire group. Okay? So, uh, Let's go. Yes, ma'am, you get the first question. Yeah, and you can use my mic here. Here you go. Welcome, Mr. CEO. First time in the South of your cab. We're so excited to have you. Well, I mean in this, in this area. But anyway, okay, well, that's fine. Okay, but anyway, my apologies. Okay, well, this time we got the people out, so we're excited about that, and thank you for coming. We appreciate you very much. This won't be the last. But my question to you is, is that I'm a native of Metro Atlanta, DeKalb mostly. I went to elementary in Atlanta, high, uh, high school in DeKalb, and college. I went to Murphy, okay? I am concerned about the fact that the cab is not looking like it used to look, as far as the cleanliness. And I, I'm not telling you what I've heard, I'm telling you what I know. I've been uh, traveling around the cab and Moreland and uh, Memorial, especially where s uh, filling stations are, Gresham Road, Clifton Church, Boulder Crest, White Mills, uh, South DeKalb Mall, I went to the office and expressed my concern behind uh, Metro PC. They never clean because they don't look behind there. So I am begging you, I don't know whose responsibility it is, but DeKalb used to then look like this when we didn't have people that looked like us in office. We need to do something and do it now. Thank you very much. And, and, and I appreciate that question and what I like that she said is that we need to do something <clears throat> because it really is going to be a we thing and let me tell you why. Uh, I mentioned when I opened that we've lost 21 percent in the value of real estate. Now let me explain to you what that means. Real estate, the value of real estate, because our primary source of revenue is property taxes, directly determines whether we have the resources to deliver services. As a result of that decline, We've reduced our spending. When, when I became CEO, we were spending more than we were bringing in. We had a healthy reserve account, which is our rainy day fund, our savings account. And so the, uh, in order to avoid raising taxes, the, uh, the, the county government was making decisions to dip into the budgetary reserve account and draw it down. It would be more, no different than any of us if we had a savings account and somebody lost their job. Suddenly the revenue coming into home falls and we just say, well, we want to continue our standard of living as opposed to reducing our, sp our expenses. And so we start taking out of savings. Well, you know what happens. You can't do that forever. It's just not sustainable. So we got to a point where our reserves were dangerously low. And we had to raise taxes, our tax rate. 
And we raised our tax rate yes, last year, but I have a fundamental principle. And the principle is that government should tighten its belt before asking our citizens to do more. And so we tightened our belt. We cut our spending by $130 million. That's over 20%, about 24% of our spending was re reduced. Now we feel that. We couldn't just continue to deliver services and, and be as good looking as we look right now without restructuring government. So we had to restructure government. We had to rethink how we do departments. We had to enter into public-private partnerships. And we had to do a better job of engaging our citizens to be involved. To date, um, through our one decab efforts, we've had hundreds of thousands of volunteerism in the county. Uh, and that amounts to a savings of about $11 million. So I want to say, and you should applaud yourselves for that $11 million of savings, because that's made up part of our budgetary gap. But our vision is this, to be a clean, green, safe, and thriving county, the place where your future lives. And at the forefront of that is to be clean. And so when I first became CEO, I did a, a run through a part of the county, including this part of the county, okay? And I noticed all the signs were up. And I had my public safety team, I don't know if Wiz Miller's here, my director of public safety, I thought I saw him here. Okay, so I had to write, I called you, and you all began to do a sweep and take down all the signs that were up on the post all over the place. It looked, it looked awful. And then we, we did our great decab cleanup efforts. And we went out and got volunteers, and people who had to do community service go out over a month. And every weekend, they would go out and clean up major thoroughfares. Betty, uh, what, which streets did we do? Do you remember? Covington Highway, Memorial Drive. Then we, we did Candler Road on one, of the suite, on, on one of the clean sweeps. Glenwood. So we went through some of our major corridors and began to clean up. We then put together a task force, and several members of the task force are here. And as a result of that task force, came up with some good ideas. Some were implemented by the Board of Commissioners, some were not. But last night, I was very excited because we began our first group of code enforcement, um, what, what are we calling them? Our volunteer ambassadors. These are everyday citizens that are now being trained on enforcing our codes in their own neighborhoods because we can never hire enough code enforcement officers to do this entire county. But everybody cares about their neighborhood. And if we can deputize you and give you some authority to report code violations and get the county cleaned up within neighborhoods, that, that's the idea behind that. So that group had their first session yesterday. And so th those are the efforts that we're going about to fix the county. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Sonia Kirkland, and I'm a very active member of my community as well. And I listened to what you had to say. And I think what Ms. Holmes is saying, and to piggyback on what you're saying, as far as the sign situation and cleaning up our area, we as a community took control of that because it was constant. And we are always picking up trash. We're always taking down signs. But as a community, we had to step up and do that because we were calling code enforcement. We were calling the different people. I knew the guy over here personally. His last name was Kirkland, my last name Kirkland. We got to know each other very well. But I just say that to say is in talking to him, I understood he was overwhelmed. I understand he explained to me the large area he covered. When you call animal control, it's the same thing. They explain to you the large area that they have to cover and the shortage of people that it is to cover. So I just say that to say that we as a community stepped up to do the things that our county wasn't doing for us. And again, we can understand some of the things, but public safety is not one of those things. The break-ins are getting overwhelming over here. I mean, I think one of the meetings they said Wishing Well had 17 break-ins in a week. I mean, the gentleman just was killed at the BP gas station. You know, you have people kicking in people's doors. It's my understanding your next class for recruits won't be until May. It was pushed back until May. But we're constantly being told as a community, we 
don't have enough people to cover your area. We can't accept that when our homes are being broken into, our doors are being kicked in, our cars are being broken into, people are being killed, robbed. It's getting out of control over here. And to listen to you say it went down, it didn't go down over here. It truly did not. It increased over here. So I don't know when your stats last were taken, but take another look. And I'm, no disrespect, but take another look because over here, it is getting out of control. It is truly out of control. My other thing is, when you talked about the rec centers, Gresham Park was supposed to have some remodeling. My daughter goes to Gresham every summer to their camp. They were supposed to have some remodelings and we way overdue on that. That was pushed back. We as a community, we feel like over here we get pushed back. Our high school, it took forever. This high school was literally falling down. Many meetings I came to and you had um, leaks in the ceiling and, and the, the steps falling down and it's my understanding that the principal that they have now has done a lot to improve it but the school board finally took a surprise visit over here and that's when we got a new roof that's when improvements start being made to our community so do we look like do we act like and feel like we overlooked so much of the time that's because that's the way we feel and again Gresham got pushed back Gresham needs to have their improvement, because our children are just as important as anybody else's children. No, um, I, I agree. And on the crime issue, um, I've asked Chief O'Brien to come up from, he, uh, he's our chief of police. So and we can... will talk with Chief O'Brien. That's another thing. Our chiefs are constantly being changed. We get to know one, and we gone again. We don't even know who they are, because it's constantly a rollover over here. Yes, it is, Chief O'Brien. I mean, it, it's constantly, when we get to know who our leaders are over here, is shuffled around and everybody, you all know that. The ones that involve, you know it's true. We're constantly being shuffled around so we don't know we've been told, call this person, contact this person. You get to know that person, they are gone. Then you're like, okay, well who do I call now? So it is a big gap and we are constantly, it is, it's a shuffle. It really is over here. I can't say about all the county but I know what I experienced over here. And I'm gonna let you get to that but let me just get, get my list off. <laughs> All right, well, but, but can, I, I won't ask you, I'll let you finish, but can we at least, because Address you're giving that? me a lot. Okay. And, and I, I want to, because okay. I, I want to respond at least a part of it. Okay. I want Chief O'Brien to respond to the crime issue, and he can tell you about the stats, and he can answer specifically about what's going on here. Okay. But uh, I want to answer a, a broader question, because I, I hear you talking about a feeling of neglect here. Yeah. And what I want you to know is that there's no area of this county that is being targeted for neglect. Now, again, we've got and have had over the last three years a revenue problem in this county. Mm -hmm. And that's why I came in and I said, first of all, we got to stop overspending. And then I took a very unpopular stand and I went to the Board of Commissioners and I said, we've got to raise the tax rate, okay? And the, the, the millage rate, is it? Okay. And we did last year. We were able to get that millage rate raised, uh, but we had taken a very significant hit. So I want you to know that we're operating at a budget of about, you know, over a hundred million dollars less than the budget that we inherited because we're in a recession. Now, there's some things that you can do by being more efficient, and we've done that. We've restructured government, but there comes a point in time when money does matter because money is resources. The, in order to get the, enough police officers out of the academy, you got to be able to pay them. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to pay them competitive salaries, mm -hmm. and you got to offer them good benefits, and all those things cost money. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, public safety has always been our number one priority, and we've done a very good job of restructuring the, the, the department and making a lot of progress. I'm gonna let Chief O'Brien talk about that, but understand money matters, and we're operating with a lot less today than we had three or four years ago as a result of the recession. The other thing I want to comment on before I turn it over to, to Chief O'Brien is Gresham Park. I was just over there about maybe about a month ago and we did a groundbreaking uh, new path that is running along that park. Outside. So, mm -hmm. Well, outside, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, mm -hmm. but let, me, let me let you understand that nobody is getting 100% these days. 
Nobody is getting everything they want in any community, anywhere in the cab, anywhere in Metro Atlanta, or anywhere across the United States. So you, there are improvements that are occurring. I can't tell you that we can take you all the way to the, you know, 100 yards, but I can advance you closer to the goal. Well, let me and ask you something. With those, the money that was spent, the children don't walk that, that trail. The children don't go on that trail. That, that trail, honestly, will probably hardly ever be used. But for the children, for the inside facilities, for the children, mm -hmm. why was that not money not channeled in the, the inside and not the outside? Okay, you want, you want to sure. Yeah, I'll be glad to. Yes. The, there, there is an improvement to the Gresham Rec Center, renovations to the facility. It was just bid and awarded. Purchasing director is back there and can confirm it. So it's a good contractor, Lichty Construction. So contracts will be circulating. They should be starting work, say, within a couple months. Now, it will be like six months of construction work. So the summer camp there will temporarily be in a, be in a school while they're renovating the rec center. But that bid has been awarded. It was a very good bid, so there's going to be funds left in that account, mm -hmm. which could then go for some additional work on walkways or pavilions, et cetera. So it is moving. My understanding of why that one was delayed a while is that there was some structural concern, I think, on the back wall of the building years ago. Maybe a truck hit it or something. And so they had to spend a lot of time with the engineers making sure that that didn't have to be the main work. Once they confirmed it was structurally sound, now they've got the rest of the renovations bid and awarded. So that okay. is getting ready to start. Thank now, you. Now, now, the one thing I, I wanted to add, and, and thank you, Ted. Ted is our, Ted Reinhardt is our deputy COO over our infrastructure group of departments. So we now have groups of departments working together as opposed to individual departments. We've broken down the silos. That's part of our, in, our efficiency efforts. But, but what I want you to know is that we passed a bond referendum for parks improvements in 2006. The citizens of DeKalb County voted for that. And as part of that, w again, some of that money was just sitting in the pots. And I directed when I became CEO that we begin to make those improvements. So, if the, and, and, and the voters knew which, what the projects were. We didn't come in and change those projects. There were certain projects. And we've gone and we've made the improvements. We're making the improvements to those projects that were on the list. I can't go in and create new projects that weren't on that list I don't have a new pot of money, but that pot of money can only be spent on those purposes, and we are spending that money and making those improvements. So when, when I talked about the libraries and the rec centers, including that rec center in Gresham Park that is, is about where construction is about to begin, what I'm really referring to is that money that was voted on and approved by the voters and that we're not going to let just sit around and let the cost continue to rise and then, be, and then have to come and tell you, Oops, we're sorry, we're not able to deliver the product. We're going to deliver the product. So are we able to get a library over here with some of that money that's been is a li I, I, don't, is, I don't know if libraries were on the list. Uh, <laughs> was, uh, was I mean, in our area, for our children yeah. over here. All right, I, I hear you. You got How many more questions you got? <laughs> <laughs> is it too hard? I'm just trying, I, I just want to make sure. I, okay. No, Let him answer the question about the libraries, okay? Go ahead. Yeah, there was in the bond issue, the library bond, a new library on River Road area in mm -hmm. Ellenwood. Mm -hmm. That's that the design is about complete, say 97 percent complete, and they mm -hmm. still have funds set aside to do it. Okay. So the challenge is not building the library. It's what the CEO is talking about with the operating budget right mm -hmm. now, because the libraries had to cut staff like every other department, mm -hmm. even if that had already been built and was open, they don't have the staff to put in a new building. The one that's just about to open on Candler, for instance. Depending on how the final budget vote goes next month, it's going to be a close call whether they have enough money to open that one on time and put the staff in it because people are still retiring or quitting and the money's so tight. We so don't there get is money one, though, to build right? a new library on River okay. Road. That is in the budget. But until they know they have enough operating money for the staffing, if we rushed it and just built it today, it'd sit empty for a year or two, and then they'd say, why would you build a new building and you left it empty? Gotcha. We can check that off. And, and, um, and, and, and you know, and that, that happened in Stonecrest. We have a beautiful new library there. I, I remember but that it's they sat, couldn't open and couldn't it staff it. It sat there for about a year, maybe a little right. bit more, because we didn't have staffing. It's open now. Now, I want the chief to talk about the situation. The with crime, the which is important. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, 
your, your uh, question about crime being down, departmentally this year we had a 10% reduction in violent crime and a 3% reduction in property crimes. But what about over here? Was that decap wide or over here? I don't have the here? specific numbers with me for here. Boy, the, and, and if you give me a second, that's what I'm going to get to, though. Residential burglaries continue to be the driving force that we face, not just here in the South Precinct, but throughout the county. We have a continuing problem with juveniles committing residential burglaries. We're working with the juvenile courts, the magistrate court, and the DA's office on programs that we can come up with to target these individuals. We, we've identified groups of them. We, we had a particular incident down in our East Precinct this summer where one child, one juvenile, was arrested five times by that precinct for burglary. We're chasing the same ones around day after day, and it gets very aggravating right. for us as well, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. we, we feel your pain on it, and we are working diligently on it. 3% uh, reduction is not near what we'd like to see it. Uh, we're, we're talking probably a couple of, uh, I, I guess on an average, probably somewhere around 12 burglaries a day in the precinct itself, not just out in this area, but the entire South Precinct way more than we'd like to see, obviously. But we continue to chase the same criminals around. We need the court system mm -hmm. to do something. We need y'all to push the court systems to do something. They don't want to hear it just from me. They need to hear it from the victims that they're not going to stand for it any longer. So we're working on our end. We need your help as well. The other side of it is we got to have the community involvement with neighborhood watch programs. You have to look out for one another. We, we have a very strong program here at our South Precinct with Sheila O'Rear, our public education specialist. She'll be glad to come out to your, your community and help you coordinate a neighborhood watch program. That's what it's about, looking out for one another when we're at work. We gotta take care of each other. And then thirdly, if you're trying to keep up with the crime in your area, if you'll go to the police website, thecabpolice.com, there, there's crime track. Uh, it's called crime track. You can actually track what's going on in your area. We've also added this year uh, another icon on there where we put up our monthly stats. You can see what's going on throughout the county, uh, not just specifically in your area, but what we're having to deal with countywide. And then thirdly, on, on your issue on, on transition down here at the South Precinct, we did make a move uh, uh, earlier this past year. Uh, some of those moves come t uh, sometimes come from promotions that we make. Uh, if an if individual gets promoted, we normally don't leave them in the same area uh, supervision-wise. We put them somewhere else to, to get a good basis for supervision where they're not working with the same individuals that they came up through the ranks with. So, yes, you did have transition, but you've got a great major down at South Precinct, Ed Jones, uh, and he'll work with you or the community and he's gonna be there. We're not making any moves. Ed's doing a fabulous job down there. If you don't know Major Jones and his crew, you need to get to know him. Thank you. All right, I see how we gonna do this. So I took okay. my jacket off. I, I hope see. that's all right. All right. Never let him see you sweat. <laughs> well, no, no, you're making me sweat. So I'm gonna... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hear you because I know it's others. Um, the, I understand the cutbacks, right. uh, but. Uh, you know, it's just been suggested. We're probably gonna have to take one more and then I'm gonna ask everybody to limit their, their the two questions. So okay. I, you can get back. I'm gonna let you have one more because I just threw that rule at you. But you know, um, we, we wanna get as many people in as we possibly can. Okay. Okay, even with the cutbacks, I just wanna say um, for two years, we've been trying to get the retention pond cleaned in our community. And for two years, they keep closing it up and saying it's been done. That's not adequate. And then you, you go and you open another one, and they'll tell you we're going to get to it within 90 days. And another year passes, and it still doesn't get done. And as a county, that's just not efficient that you have people that are saying they're doing the work, and it's not getting done. Okay, I want you to see Ted Reinhardt again, who's over, over here, and uh, he's going to follow up with you. And, and I should have started out because for anybody whose question doesn't get asked, let me give you my phone number, because you don't have to come here and unload on me. You can, al you can always <laughs> call me, all right? 404-371-2881, and let's see. Am I going to talk to you, or the secretary going to bust Ask for Karen. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. 
Her office is right next door to mine. <laughs> All right. 404-371-2881, right? I normally tell people ask for Nina Hall, but I'm not gonna mention, <laughs> I'm not gonna call her out and mention her name like that. Most folks who get stuff done, they ask for Nina Hall, but I'm not gonna do that to Nina Hall again tonight, okay? All right, where's Nina? Where are you, Nina? She just left, okay. Oh, they, that, the one hiding over there in the corner. Okay, all right, yes, sir. Yes, um, my name is Lenny Ware. I'm with ABLE, Atlantans Building Leadership for Empowerment under Gamaliel, ABLE. Uh, we raise up leaders in the community. We train, we're proud to say we trained President Obama to be a lead organizer in South Chicago and appreciate the work you've been doing, Mr. CEO. I have two questions. Um, I, I, I've been a really good friend of uh, Penny Stewart's family and we have football players here at Cedar Grove High School. And um, I noticed that it's very dark in this area and when I go to Panthersville Stadium when they play the football games, um, they're like the, the locker rooms and the lighting, like we were leaving the stadium and as you walk back to that college, it was very dark there. And a lot of times, you know, kids can be kids. Um, what are your doable solutions and your action plan for like maybe improving the lighting in this general area, yeah. make it lighter, especially the facilities at Panthersville Stadium for the football players and the safety there. And what are, um, and also I, I'm, uh, do you have any plans for a committed partner mentoring program? Like um, in Fulton County, they have Yes Atlanta Youth Experiencing Success, which is with the Fulton County court system. And Shelby Jackson, she, she negotiated T.I. sentence down from 30 years to, to 10 months. And, and he's been talking to our youth. Um, I heard what the police chief said about, you know, the kids and juvenile problems. Have you ever, have you thought about, you know, a committed partner youth, a uh, committed partner mentoring program that the, a judge could, you know, basically in the juvenile court as an alternative to boot camp uh, to help these young kids to have a committed partner mentor to help them. So once again, what are, do you have any doable solutions on lighting and the, in the athletic department right. and I, I, I'm, I'm gonna try to be as efficient as I can the, the lighting issue I just want to thank you I want to thank you mr. Ware, for the work that Abel does I'm, I'm very familiar with the organization and your affiliation and, and how you train uh, President Obama thank you uh, I, I uh, want to again uh, refer you to Ted Reinhardt who's seated right in front of you and in me as well and uh, I think he can, if you would help him identify the areas, he can send out the uh, appropriate team. He's also sitting next to our new plan director of planning and sustainability, Gary Cornell. And uh, so, so between infrastructure and our planning department, I think they can help you and they'll come out and assess the areas and then tell you what the next steps would be. Um, we are doing a number of things for our young people. Uh, I think one of our challenges is to do it in a much more coordinated way, both on the preventative side and then uh, through our courts and our judges, we have a number of programs for youths who find themselves in trouble within the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm not gonna so much speak to that because that's, we fund the courts, the county government funds the courts, but I don't run the court. It, you know, there's nobody who reports to me who runs the court system outside of the traffic court. Okay, that's done by independent elected officials. But I wanna say, for example, our, our police department has what we call PAL Plus, Police Athletic League Plus, uh, which is doing a number of things to mentor youth. Um, our One to Care program is working with, collaborating with the school system to do the STEM program. Over the summer, we've had uh, young people, the school system has offered their facilities, and we've offered personnel to give students uh, activities. In fact, one year they came up with their, they created their own form of government. I'm proud to say it was a CEO form of government. They elected a CEO. They, you know, they found that to be the model that they wanted to emulate. They elected a CEO and some county commissioners, and they did a pretty admirable job of conducting their affairs. And so, and, and then some of the commissioners have some programs for our young folks as well. I'd be more than happy to get that information, some specifics about each of those programs to you. And I just want to say thank you for the way you stood so strongly on the Transportation Reinvestment Act and the mass transit that's coming. Um, I know that there is, you know, that can also be another side, but you, you, I, I really appreciate, we've done a lot of work on that, and I appreciate your work on well, that. Well, thank you for saying that, and let, let, me, let me say that. Let, 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 let me say this about, first of all, you know, despite lies that have been told by some, I did stand strong on that. We were able to get $225 million in funding for South DeKalb 
to extend the I-20 line, which builds a foundation for the future, when it was slated to get zero, is the fourth highest funded, thank you, the fourth highest funded transit project on the list, the first highest transit project in the Clifton Corridor, which employs uh, uh, thousands of people and generates billions of dollars into our county economy every year, is the highest funded project. DeKalb County, and, 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 and if you'll just allow me a minute to talk about the Transportation Investment Act and the transportation referendum that is gonna be voted on in really just six months from now in July. And some of you may know about that, but I think too many people are still unaware that there's a, a couple of important elections this year. Let, let me just say this. One, of course, is in November, we've gotta reelect the President of the United States, okay? <laughs> Can, can, can I say that? Amen. We got to elect a president. Maybe that's the way I'm supposed to say it. Or re-elect a president. Okay, and, and, and then this summer, we're going to have a number of elections. County commissioners, CEO. I'm running for CEO. Uh, there'll be, uh, thank you. I'll be making an announcement about, uh, well, a, a, an important announcement tomorrow at noon at the county courthouse. But let, 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 me, let me keep this on the level where it needs to be. And that is the transportation referendum will also be in July, okay? And that will be, we'll be voting for a penny, an extra penny sales tax, which will be collected in the 10 county region, which will be used to fund transportation improvements. Now, we all know that we have a traffic congestion problem. Amen? I mean, I think whether you, whether you agree with the referendum or not, if you've lived in Atlanta more than five minutes, you know that we have a traffic congestion problem, okay? This will not only move us towards fixing that problem, but it also helps us relieve and improve our air quality problem that we here have in Atlanta. And it will create jobs. For those of us who live in DeKalb County, about $800 million in sales tax monies will come out of DeKalb, but we stand to gain $1.3 billion in transit and transportation improvements, mostly transit improvements, okay? Of the four top major transit projects, two of them are located in DeKalb County. I mentioned the Clifton Corridor and the extension of the I-20 rail. So we have a lot to gain here and an immediate impact on the local economy by the creation of jobs. And so I'll be glad to talk more about that if you want, but I do wanna let you all know this is important. It's important to relieve traffic congestion. It's important to improve our infrastructure, and it's important for the creation of jobs. Yes, ma'am. Okay, my name is Latinus Carter. I've been in the Cap County 20 years. I'm a native of Atlanta. My question to you, the subdivision I live in, next to the subdivision, it's about 10 acres of land that the Cap County bought before you came in office. That land has been vacant for the last six years. Every summer the grass grow this high, you have about three houses on this land down here. Kids in there, I'm telling who might be in there, but we need to do something about this land. It's supposed to be in a uh, park, I don't know, but we need to do something about this land down here. You mean about the maintenance of the land? Yes, the maintenance of the land or whatever you all, it's supposed to be in a park, I don't know what you all gonna do with it, but I like mm -hmm. to know, and my people in my subdivision like to know what's gonna happen with this land. Uh, is Roy here? Can Roy speak to that? Or Ted, do you wanna speak to that? Riverwalk Ridge, is that You know, I, 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 I'm gonna just tell you as he's coming up because he can tell you the specifics. Everything costs money. Everything costs money. And the, the issue with the money and getting a tax rate adjusted hasn't so much always been a problem with the, with the people because I think the people of this county have told us loud and clear that you want quality services and we've heard them. But even when we got the millage rate passed last year, which we had to do, because Commissioner Johnson and I, as soon as that got passed, he supported the millage increase. He and I flew up to New York with several members of our staff to meet with the rating agencies because we had to get our bond rating restored because ultimately that saves money. And, and we had to go to market in order to borrow money to improve our water and sewer system. And, and that was big too. And so we were able to save the day. But the biggest impediment to sometimes getting the funding has come from some members of the Board of Commissioners who want to cut. I mean, there's an interesting conversation going on in Washington right now. And there are some, Tea Party, okay, 
who believe that the way we should balance a budget is just by cutting. It's a one-dimensional approach. Somebody said, that's my county commission. Some of them. And, and others will say that we need to both reduce our spending and increase revenue, a multi-dimensional approach. Now, I got to tell you, that's where I stand. So cut spending first, but there's some programs that our citizens depend upon. And I'm going to let, Ted, you answer that specific question. Yes, sir. Um, what I'll do is get, get you to show me a little map of exactly the parts that you're talking about. That the parks bond had two major pots of money. There was one for property acquisition, uh, and then there was another for specific park improvements. So the property you're talking about, I don't think there was, was a project for specific improvements in that part of the bond, and so it was probably nominated by someone for green space acquisition, but that still means we need to maintain it and keep right. it safe. And so I'll, I'll come over and get you to show me exactly where it is, and then I'll check with the uh, parks or sanitation staff and at least make sure somebody is keeping it uh, in, in good condition or maybe go ahead and demolish the buildings if there's not another plan for it until such future time as there's some money for a project there. My last question is, you know, I work for APD. All the projects in Atlanta has been vanished. So that means we're getting all the people from the project in the, the Cab County. So if we have to go on taxes to pay the officer, we need to do that because that's what we're getting over here. The, the people from the project and the kids breaking in our houses. We got to do something about that. Okay. I'm willing to pay more for a police okay. officer. And, and I, I appreciate that. So understand, I put it in the budget and then I'm going to use last year as an example. Last year's budget, we got into a big budget battle with some members, and I want to emphasize I'm only talking about some members of the commission, because they decided to just cut costs. And then, at the end of the day, they didn't ever come up with an alternative plan. The members of the commission who sit on the commission's budget committee voted against the budget without an alternative plan. They didn't come up with an, in other words, if you're going to say no, you have a responsibility to say yes to something. What is the plan then? And so I hear st uh, our citizens say over and over again that they want services. Whether it's public safety or whether it's parks and rec, they want the services. But the services have to be paid for. And when the county revenues falls, something has to give way. Yes, we built facilities, but sometimes we've not been able to open those facilities when we wanted to because they have to be staffed and they have to be maintained. And that costs money. So if you want services and you're willing to pay for the services, understand that the buck in that instance stops with the Board of Commissioners because they adopt the budget, okay? Yes. Good evening. My name is Denise Law and I'm a longtime resident of this area. And my concern is my community where I live. I live here. I don't live in Stone Mountain. So my concern about the parks and recreations, I'm glad to, to hear that the improvement for Gresham Park is coming, but Gresham Park is not our only park. We have a family community park that's off Boulder Crest Road, and it has not been improved. I know for a fact over the last five years or six years, we've been promised and promised and promised to the point that I no longer listen. My concern is, um, with the allocations that the county have, I've asked my commissioners, and we have two, and for those of you that don't know, it's Kathy Gannon and Lee Mays are our co uh, commissioners for this area. I've asked them on a number of occasions to at least provide us with a list from the budget of projects that have been allocated in DeKalb County for this year, next year, and projected on in the future at least five years. I know you guys do more than a five-year projection. I've seen it before. I like to see how much of that project and budget allocation is allocated to this area? I've asked for the information. I don't see it. I don't see any improvements. Our roads on Boulder Crest Road, if you go down Boulder Crest to Constitution, where our fire department is, it's horrible. I don't see any improvements on our signs, nor on our street lights are not being improved, and no road, no road improvements at all. And the infrastructure for this area is severe because we get traffic from Henry County, Clayton County coming through the cab to hit 285. So I like to know and I like to see if someone can provide to us, from my understanding, it's public knowledge, it's public record. 
Uh, tell me how do I get it out, out. You can email me, fax it, scan it, whatever works for you. But I like to know, because I like to see out of that budget, when you come before us and say we need to pay, 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 I don't mind paying, but I want to CCC where I live. I'm not going to Stone Mountain to take my daughter or my grandkids to the park when there's a park down the street from me. It's not feasible. But the park, there isn't even a sign outside for our park. Nobody knows it's there. We have to put a big paper sign up to tell people the park is there. The residents here want to use our services here. That's one of my questions. So my second question is, and I guess to that statement, and you can address it if you like, and please, please do not wear this on your shoulder. It's strictly business. My next question is, what Dunwoody have already pulled out, from my understanding, when they pulled out, it was approximately $26 million. Now with Brookhaven asking to pull out also, that's approximately, from what I understand, $28.5 million. My question is, is Cedar Grove, Ellenwood, and Connolly going to have to... Are we going to have a partner with them and pull out to get the services that they now have and we don't have? That's my question. All right, let, let me answer that. Thank you. And uh, I don't wear it on my sleeve. I, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate your passion that you have for your community. Yeah, I live and, here. And, I pay taxes here. Absolutely. And and because um, I want to answer the second part of your question. No problem. You, you can stand it. You, you, you don't have to. Well, I respect you. I don't oh. mind standing. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, the, the, uh, the, the idea, everybody cares first and foremost about the community where they live. And, and I want to talk about this whole thing of cityhood and the creation of cities. And what I've asked our state legislators to do, mm -hmm. not just the DeKalb legislators, but starting working with them. And they pretty much, I think, embrace <coughs> this concept along with me and the Board of Commissioners. Um, we have bad laws, in my view, that allows for the creation of cities, and this is why. You're right, when Dunwoody was created, the county loses somewhere between 15 and $18 million a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, if Brookhaven, with the proposed boundaries, should be created, we'd lose somewhere in excess of $20 million a year in revenue. Why? Because the legislation that's drafted pits cities against counties. Now, a city is a viable form of local government. We're not anti-city. We have wonderful cities in DeKalb County, and we embrace them as part of DeKalb County. And of course, we have a wonderful county. It's a viable form of local government. And in DeKalb County, because we're a large urban county, we really operate as a city. Most of the type of services that you may be used to if you lived in another place are being provided by DeKalb County government, just as they would be provided in the city elsewhere. Um, but because of bad legislation, they allow cities to cherry pick the, the mo when I say the choices, I mean from a fiscal, mm -hmm. those that generate the most revenue, commercial areas, they can just gerrymander, draw boundaries any kind of way they want to. Let me pick this pocket over here. Let me get this one over here. Just as Dunwoody was viable because they took in the perimeter commercial area. And the reason mm -hmm. why, Dr. Samama, I don't know if you're here. We were just talking about this. The reason why done that perimeter center is so viable is because largely due to investments that the cab county government made in that area i sat on the board of commissioners when we were investing millions of dollars a year in a way that that dunwoody government could never have done now i'm not anti-dunwoody right. but i am pro-fairness i'm not anti-brookhaven but i am pro-fairness sound like to me and then it, so it creates <laughs> it creates a, a hysteria oh, if you will money. Because what happens is that, and here's what you're saying, mm -hmm. well then, if they're incorporating and drawing in the choices, commercial areas, and their proposed boundaries, I better go ahead and incorporate some of those choice areas in my boundaries well, as well. No, what I'm saying is that they're getting, the, they're getting the services from what I read today and on yesterday and through this week, their services that they have required has improved tremendously over the service that they received now, from the I, county. I, I, I would, and that's just what I've read. I, I, I'm not saying whether it's I, I, right, I, I, wrong, or indifferent. No, I would beg to differ. Now, now we, we could probably have a difference of opinion and right. never be able to objectively uh, prove that. Right. But I would offer to you that there are some class and racial arguments that play that into all of that, OK? I and, agree. And you know, uh, I agree. everybody doesn't want to talk about that. No, we talk Le about Le it. Leadership to cab is now taking on that whole issue, so we can talk about that. You're right. But there's not necessarily better services. I will say 
I would support anybody who wants to create an extra layer of government in order to get heightened services and pay for it. But that's not what's happening. They're not paying a premium for it. They're taking from the resources of the county, that they already have. but still depending on the county for many of the services, the school services, the in many instances, police services and fire, mm -hmm. the court services. Mm -hmm. We still run the elections. Mm -hmm. We still run the jails. So they depend upon us for criminal justice and for safety. Now. Okay. So we need better legislation to answer that. Now I'm going to let Ted answer now the question. Now my last question, then he can answer now. I'll, I'll be seated. My last question.